first became interested in buildings when I was about 15 years old. And of course, I lived here in this small terraced house and my mother and father wanted me to be an undertaker. Now, I didn't fancy that, you know, so I got on my bicycle and I pedalled off to the Youth Employment Bureau where they fixed me up with a job as a joiner. He's not a bricklayer, but he built that. Oh, it was awful, I, I didn't want him to do that. The evening news came round and took the photograph when I was at work. <laughs> I built this chimney when I, when I were about 17 years old. We had a stack like the one next door, you know, with five pots on which uh, four of them were disused and smoke only went up one, so I thought, well, we'll take all these four down and uh, build a nice chimney stack, you see. So I didn't really design it, I just built it. It just ended up that shape. Everybody said I was crazy, you know. <laughs> but um, it never cracked and uh, it's got a lovely draft on it, you know. Uh, suck your house slippers off when it's going at bottom. <laughs> He went to art school. When he was about 17, you'd think he'd work in office, not doing what he does now. My work as a joiner got me into some of the splendid mansions that the cotton mill owners and bleach works owners have built. This actual house was built by a bleach works owner. The thing is, I couldn't help but notice, having come from an house that hadn't got any scutting boards, you know, the quality of the woodwork. All the beautiful scutting boards and marble fireplaces and architraves and panel doors and best of all, the fancy plastered ceilings. Made me wonder, you know, however did they do it? Of course, it's a pub now, so really, everybody can enjoy it. Hmm? Hmm. The Victorians went to great lengths to make things pleasing to the eye, whether it were a great civil engineering project or something as small as a window catch. The great detail, you know, much more ornate than what we do these days. On their buildings they did all this ornamentation on a really grand scale, something I was able to see at close quarters. About 30 years ago, when I was in my prime, <laughs> I got the job of repairing the lantern on top of this town hall behind me. Then I thought, you know, I've reached the pinnacle of my career. Round the top, uh, in the balustrade of the, uh, of the lantern, there are 16 stone pillars. And I made a machine and actually turned these stone pillars. And then, of course, I taught myself into gilding the ball on top and pointing the wall lantern right down to the top of the lead. When it was built in the 19th century, it was a time when they had a great respect for the past, and they wanted their buildings to reflect the values of an earlier age. They built a new Houses of Parliament that matched the medieval splendours of Westminster Abbey right next door, and they made country houses look like castles. Eastner Castle in Hereffordshire isn't really a proper castle. What it is is a big, comfortable country house designed to look like one. It was built for the first Earl Summers in the first part of the 19th century, and he wanted everybody to know how rich and well-established his family were. So he commissioned the architect Robert Smirk to design a place that would look as big and impressive as one of the castles that Edward I had built nearly a thousand years earlier. Eastner took six years to build and cost over £85,000. And at a time when Britain's aristocracy felt threatened by the recent French Revolution, it sent a very clear message to the ordinary people round about. It said, remember who your masters are. We can find out such a lot about Smirk's building techniques and the way he went about doing things because of all the records he left behind here at Eastner Castle. And this is James, the current owner, who's got all these wonderful plans and things and he's going to tell me a few tales and read me a few letters about it. 
Good. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're very lucky that we've kept these. There is a very good record, both of drawings and of letters, describing mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first things to notice is there was a huge amount of stone required for the house. They were very keen to quarry it locally. Mm -hmm. So in the original estimate, which um, is here, which was for a total bill of £82,000 <laughs> approximately. It's incredible, isn't it? Um, they said, we don't expect to take the stone more than five miles. But in mm. fact, when they looked locally, the stone mm. was mostly granite around here, mm -hmm. but actually they had to look elsewhere. Mm. There's a letter here saying, I'm mm. sorry to say we must abandon all hope of procuring building stone from mm. the ground westward of the house. Yeah. So then they went to look a bit further. And that's how he came down to the Forest mm. of Dean, and the house is built of Forest of Dean yeah. sandstone. Very obvious, Mr Smut kept very tight controls over the finances and his accounting system. The, the one we've already seen is this mm. costing for the whole, mm. whole building of £82,000. And the interesting thing is at the end it had cost £85,000, mm. so it would be only £3,000 over budget. Yeah. But this account is interesting because it shows how he was drawing on craftsmen from mm. around the country. And there's some, yeah, obviously some London. very busy ones in mm. London from Smith yeah. Street. Mm. One from Carlisle. Eh? Mm. And then finally at the bottom of the list he's put his own bill in for £1,641.11 mm. mm. shillings and tuppence. It's quite obvious he, he used a lot of you know, new techniques for, the, for that period. I think Smirk was prepared to use modern methods, or what were becoming mm. modern methods then, mm. and um, introduced cast iron into the house. I think there was a shortage of wood at, mm. at the time that the castle was being built, so although a lot was cut here, they still needed more wood um, than, or, or support mm. material. Than what they could find. Than yeah. what they could find. Mm. So um, Smirk used big cast iron beams to support the structure, and to enable us to have these large roof mm. spans, which otherwise could only be managed with arches. The reason for the great cast iron beam at Eastner Castle is to actually hold up the, the front wall of the tower, you see, because this wall on this tower is situated roughly halfway along the great hall. So instead of building a great big arch like the Normans would have done, they, they cast these two iron beams. They're held together by big bolts with big square-headed nuts. The whole roof's made of iron, there's no wood at all. The only wood involved is the, is the actual ceiling, you know, of the, the Great Hall. When you get up there inside the roof space, you find that they're all units. They're all like pieces, say, eight feet long with dovetails on the end and mortise holes and pin holes and holes for keys to be knocked through. So the rate of assembly will be very quick. And of course, it, there's no... You know, you normally get dry rot in it and woodworm and all that. It'll be there in a thousand years if you keep going up and giving it a coat of tar every now and again. Once Eastner Castle had been built, they proceeded with the interior work and it was all pretty lavish. This is the Gothic drawing room, which was redecorated in 1849. And for me, this is the height of Victorian splendour and embellishment and it's a very fine example of how good they were at decorating places back in them days. The man responsible for the room was the architect and designer Augustus Welby Pugin. Pugin had a great passion for Gothic architecture of the medieval cathedrals, all those pointed archways and ornate stonework. To him, Gothic architecture wasn't just a passing fancy. He really believed in it with his heart and soul. This is St Giles at Cheadle in Staffordshire, which was designed by Pugin when he was at the height of his career. He got together a team of craftsmen to provide the decorative detail for buildings like this. And I went to see how some of it was done. Eugene's beautiful tile designs were actually manufactured by Herbert Minton and Chrissy is going to let me have a do at making one in exactly the same way as they did. Hi Fred. Hi. Okay, <coughs> this is one of the earliest forms of decorative tile manufacture. This mm. is very much mm. a Pugin design. Mm. So we start off with the buff colour, the light mm. colours, mm. and they're pressed into the plaster mould mm. Mm. Uh, and then the background clay mm. is added. Mm. You want to have a go, Fred? Yeah, yeah, go on. There's the clay, just <laughs> use your thumb and push yeah, it into uh, all the corners. Uh, uh, hang on, I've not got enough on. Uh, 
That's it. You're going to take your mm -hmm. cake of clay mm -hmm. and just pat that on the surface and yeah. slap it down right in the middle there. Yeah. Boom. That's it. Yeah. And then you need to beat the clay in, mm. beat a row up the middle. That's consolidated the clay, yeah. and the next job is to mm. wire the surplus off. So yeah. if you take your mm. wire, mm. stretch it out taut. Mm. Uh, it's quite hard stuff. Mm. It is, isn't it? So we can get and rid then... of that. You can, yeah. That's it, that's enough. Pull it out. And mm. that's the, uh, the back stamp. Mm-hmm. There it mm. is. Once it's dry, we can release it round the edges. Then we take a liquid version of the clay and pour it into the recesses that are left in the pattern. The final stage in the process is to scrape away the surplus on top of the tile. This is very time consuming. So as Minton became more successful, they had to find ways of speeding up production and they started to use tile presses, beginning to semi-automate the process. Even so, many of the printed designs still needed to be finished and glazed by hand. So you can see Pugin came up with a strange mixture of the old and the new, and he created some magnificent designs, and said he never stopped working, you know. He did over 2,000 designs for the fixtures and fittings in the Houses of Parliament alone. And this was the job that made Pugin's name. He got it as a result of the old Palace of Westminster burning down in 1834. The commission to rebuild it had actually gone to someone else. Sir Charles Barry was the main man for the classical style of architecture that was popular at this time, buildings like Bolton Town Hall. But the contract for the job stated that it had to be in the Gothic style, which wasn't really his thing, so he turned to Pugin for help. Work began in 1837, and the pugin Burry partnership was dead right for the job. While Pugin looked after the detail of the design, Burry was free to tackle the even more difficult problems of actually to build the palace in the first place. As you can see, it's, it's a building site today, but in 1836 it would have looked pretty similar, but for one or two things. The fact that there would have been quite substantial scaffolding, I should imagine, not even fur poles, you know, big 18 square blocks of timber and really grand platforms for working on. It would have been a hive of activity using all the most up-to-date machinery of the day. Even though it looks medieval, there's a lot of quite modern materials been used in its construction. You know, I mean, in, in medieval times, you know, any, everything were wrought iron, you know, it had to be banged with a big hammer in a fire. Here, there's the great use of cast iron everywhere. Like, all the roof is cast iron plates. And there's a lot of iron, cast iron girders and beams inside. So this building, although it mimics the cathedrals of the Middle Ages, the, the site, you know, when it was being built, would look very similar to them cathedrals, apart from the modern age of the 1830s, like the steam engine. In order to get the foundations for the Houses of Parliament so close to the shoreline of the river, you come up with an ingenious solution of like building a coffer dam, that means driving a great row of wooden piles into the bed of the river and making them safe and then caulking up the seams, same as they did the decks of ships. And then of course they would pump the water out of the the bank inside where they were going to do the foundations for the for the wall of the Houses of Parliament. They of course would have had steam driven pumps but I'm siphoning it out uh, or most of it. Ah, that's it. Now the builders now could proceed to put in the foundation. They put a slab of concrete in ten feet thick in the bottom and then started with the mercenary. And once the palace was built, it was left up to Pugin to decorate its interior. This is the interior of the House of Lords. A 
and here Pugin used all his skills to make a grand statement. He busied himself with every detail of the decoration, from the detailed carvings to every piece of its 1,100 items of furniture. He even designed the wallpaper. The original designs for Pugin's interiors were done by Crace Brothers. And here at Coal and Companies, they've got the actual original Pugin blocks. These blocks were used to print Pugin's patterns onto sheets of wallpaper. You have to line it up with a mark and press down hard with a foot pedal. There can be as many as seven different printing processes to go through. Another method Pugin and Crace used was to print the pattern onto the wallpaper with glue and then stick flocking to it to give it a textured look. And they still beat it on today in the same way as it was done in Pugin's time. Pugin died in 1852, but work on his designs for the Houses of Parliament went on. In 1858, the Westminster Clock Tower was completed, the one we call Big Ben, after the bell inside it. It stands 316 feet high and 40 feet square, and is constructed of Anston stone from Yorkshire with a brick core. By 1860, all the work had been completed at a total cost of just under £2,200,000. Big Ben has 334 steps leading up to the belfry and a further 59 to the lantern above. When they built this tower, they installed a steam hoist to raise up all the machinery for the clock and the bells and I suppose all the cast iron work that forms the lantern on top of Big Ben. When the job were finished, they shifted it all out the bottom. In my opinion, they should have left the steam winch because this staircase is the only way up here. And believe me, it takes it out of here. <coughs> hey. These are the original clockworks that have been here since 1859. It used to take six men eight hours to wind up the clock with these handles at each end. But of course, nowadays it's electrified, which is took a lot of hard graft out of it. But there's still certain bits of it that are mandrolic, like this one here in the middle. This has got to be done once every two days, you know. And it, it's fairly hard work, believe me. <laughs> The design of the mechanism followed strict requirements from the Astronomer Royal, who wanted to ensure that no matter how hard the wind blows on the hands outside, the rate of timekeeping remained constant. They couldn't control the temperature though. Over the seasons, the pendulum expands and contracts with the heat. So these old pennies are used to adjust the weight. Each penny makes the clock go faster by two-fifths of a second. In 1976, they had an unbelievable disaster here in this tower, you know, the, the, the mechanism on the chiming side of the clock. The brake failed and the weights began to descend inside the tower and reputedly reached the speed of 200 miles an hour, which had made these wheels go around a hell of a speed. And of course, the centrifugal force got so great, the frame blew to pieces and the wheels danced about all over the place. It only took 13 hours to get the actual clock mechanism going again, but it took a further nine months to get the chime inside right.
I don't know what they're going to say next week when I go to the hearing aid clinic. There are four quarter bells which chime the introduction to the Great Hour Bell, Big Ben. But it isn't the original Big Ben. The original one was cast at Stockton on Tees, but it shattered under the weight of the ammo when it was first hit. So they had to melt it down at Whitechapel and recast a new one. Two months after this particular bell was installed, two more cracks appeared. And of course here you can see where they chiselled in to find the true depth of the crack. There were no radiography then, you know. Then, to solve the problem, they moved the wall bell round a quarter of a turn and reduced the ammo by almost half its weight. The clock tower is the crowning glory of the Palace of Westminster and it's one of the greatest and most recognisable national monuments we've seen in the building of Britain. While we've been going about on our travels, we've met a lot of craftsmen of all sorts, you know, wallpapers, plasterers, lead men, everything, you know, stonemasons. And it's, it's so nice to know that there are still craftsmen and craftsladies about who can still do this type of work.